Labour has been accused of rebranding re illegal migration as irregular migration by the Tories. Uh, the criticism comes after the Home Office put out a post on Twitter declaring we are taking control of irregular migration, whatever that is. However, Labour denies that there's been any change, saying irregular migration is standard terminology that has always been used by the Home Office. Well, I guess it would have been because it's an obfuscation, isn't it? If you term illegal immigration as just irregular migration, it dumbs it down. It makes it seem less serious because I suggest... I suspect the Labour government know what's coming, and that is now that Keir Starmer is known as the friendly one, now that we have no deterrent in the form of the Rwanda agreement, and we have this ridiculous uh, force endeavour, this crazy approach to trying to uh, somehow prevent illegal migration to this country by smashing the gangs wherever they are in some far-flung land, uh, on the basis that that's clearly isn't going to work, the Labour Party now, I guess, have got to start making sure, as a government, as they are now, that they couch the wording, the narrative, to make things look perhaps somehow a little bit less bad than, in my opinion, they're going to be. It's called spin, I think, and thanks to Alistair Campbell, we now live in a spin world in political terms, uh, a post-truth world. Uh, well, look, let's talk about all this with Mike Jones, who's Executive Director of Migration Watch. Mike, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Uh, are you happy with this terminology change, this dumbing down of the problem of illegal migration by the Labour government? Not really. I, I've never been a fan of the term irregular migration. I, I think it's a bit of a weasel word. And, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in calling a spade a spade. Mm. You know, if, if someone enters the UK via the English Channel, if they overstay their visa or the, if they've entered via any other clandestine mean, you know, for example, the Channel Tunnel, then they're here illegally. Yes. You know, call a spade a spade. Uh, Irregular migration, it, it's a term used by, you know, policy wonks and, and academics to sort of soften uh, the implications of the term itself. And I find it quite interesting that the Labour Party are now using this in public communications. But do you think they're getting their excuses in early? Do you agree with me? Uh, sorry? Do you think they're getting their excuses in early? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think... You know, if, if, if you were talking to uh, civil servants about this and you used the term irregular migration, that would be quite sort of normal. But the fact that they're using it in public communications is quite striking. I think they're trying to take the sting out of this issue and the phenomenon because they know they've created a rod for their own back by, you know, obviously mothballing the Rwanda plan. They're going to be fast-tracking all of these illegal migration uh, applications through the asylum system and you know uh, smashing the gangs has been tried in the past and it's failed so yeah I think the Labour Party are trying to depoliticize this. Which is a and lovely three-word buzz phrase isn't it smash the gangs it's straight out yeah. of the Brexit playbook isn't it uh, take back control and so on that the problem is that the action the consequence is not going to live up to the the buzzword I mean it's pretty obvious I mean look we're seeing it already we're only four weeks into this government uh, not uh, four weeks today I think and the situation is already uh, spiralling out of control. Uh, how soon do you think before Keir Starmer has to start saying things such as, well, of course it's going to get worse before it gets better? Oh, very soon. Um, uh, I mean, you can't smash the gangs. You, you can make life difficult for the gangs, but you can't actually smash them. But there's 500 of them. I mean, 500 independent gangs. And this isn't... They're not all lined up in the same place. They're not all in a sports hall somewhere waiting yeah. to be picked off like, you know, someone throwing a bowling ball at a, a load of Skittles. I mean, this is disparate gangs that don't communicate, that aren't connected, that are across multiple countries. They're organised. They're probably involved in other things apart from trafficking, you know, drugs, arms and so on. They're sophisticated. They're big. They're powerful. Uh, Keir Starmer, just because he happened to be at the head of the Crown Prosecution Service, where some would say he didn't exactly cover himself in glory there either in some respects. I mean, it's for the birds, isn't it, that he is going to solve the entire illegal migration problem to this country uh, with this buzz phrase that basically has no substance to it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as, as you point out, the gangs are decentralised, they're agile, they're amorphous, um, they're adaptable. Hmm. You know, the National Crime Agency has described this strategy as akin to whack-a-mole. You know, one, once you 
disrupt one operation another one pops up again yeah so uh as you say it's for the birds i mean ultimately if you want to take back control of illegal immigration then ultimately you have to detain and deport people but to do that you need to amend or abolish the human rights act and obviously uh Sir Keir Starmer is is a huge supporter of the human rights act and uh you know that's not even on the table and he doesn't even have the agreement with Rwanda anymore so this this situation is going to completely spiral out of control yeah we're, we're going to come back to that in a second because uh one of the Tory leadership contenders Tom Tugendhat has said that uh, he would uh, consider, I think, or he is ready to leave the ECHR. Let's, let's, let's come back to that in a second. Um, am I being sensationalist, though, Mike, when I suggest that over the next six to 12 months we're going to see more illegal small boat arrivals uh, in this country than we've ever seen before? Uh, I, I think that's quite possible, um, certainly compared to previous years, because ultimately um, the pull factor is going to be increased you know, uh, uh, Sir Keir Starmer is going to fast track all of these um, asylum applications. And there's about 90,000 of those, Mike, right? But, but what about those that keep coming? Uh, so if there's 92,000 that he's going to fast track and effectively, you know, kind of just grant leave to remain, I mean, it's uh, a moratorium effectively. What, what about the 2,000 a week or so that are now arriving before he smashes the gangs? Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say he does smash the gangs in six months' time. Well, that's another 50,000 that presumably he's just going to grant uh, the ability to stay in this country by way of fast tracking them and getting them off the getting these people off the spreadsheet. I mean, it's it's absolutely outrageous. Well, yeah, and it's going to enhance the business model of the people traffickers because uh, they can go to their would-be clients and say, you know, listen, if, if you give me four thousand euros, I can get you across the English Channel. If you get into the UK, even though you're branded an illegal immigrant, you can claim asylum. Uh, if if you're granted asylum, great, you know, you're, you've made it. But if your asylum claim is rejected, they still can't get rid of you. If you're from an unsafe country, and most of these people are from countries that are regarded as unsafe, you know, as long as you destroy your documents, you're OK. Yeah. Um, and and this, this amnesty, I mean, this wasn't mentioned in the Labour Party manifesto, I don't think, was it? I mean, it, perhaps, as I said to a previous guest, if some of this stuff had been in the Labour Party manifesto, like, for instance, trans women, you know, being allowed to go to uh, women's prisons, I mean, we wouldn't have voted for them in perhaps the, albeit depleted numbers, that people did vote for the Labour government. I mean, it's they're hardly being transparent and honest with us when they get into government and literally two weeks later decide to grant an amnesty of what could be hundreds of thousands of illegal asylum seekers. By the way, the identity of whom mostly we don't know. We don't know if these people are criminals, uh, if they're wanted, we don't know what their history are, we don't even know what countries they've come from. Yeah, we don't know who they are. They destroy their documents and, you know, to be honest, people describe them as refugees, but they don't... No, they're uh, economic migrants, aren't they? Most of them well, are economic yeah. migrants because they're I coming mean, from the likes of Albania and India and Vietnam. They're, they're, they're the top three countries from which these boats uh, kind of ultimately arrive. Uh, those countries are not war-torn. These are people that are coming here to milk the British system. Uh, I mean, there are many people also from Iraq, Afghanistan and Iran. But the thing is, if you look at traditional refugee flows, they're what you'd call a mixed multitude. So you've got, you know, you know, you've got women, children, uh, young men, older men, grandparents, uncles, aunties, uh, you know, people travel with their extended families, you know, people travel to the closest possible location uh, that they can get to. But what, what you see with the channel crosses is the complete opposite. These people overwhelmingly are young men. They're not traveling with their extended families and they've spent a considerable amount of time outside of their home countries. The, the vast majority of them are economic migrants. Yeah, so, and, and the, the clue is the fact that it's, yes, indeed, uh, all men predominantly. If you were fleeing persecution, wouldn't you want to take your kids with you rather than leaving them in that persecution? Precisely. If, you know, if you look at data produced by the United Nations, you know, people travel with their loved ones. They travel with their families. And they don't want to be spending, you know, six months, 12 months, um, you know, sort of in exodus. They want to be seeking uh, refugee status as soon as possible. Yeah. These people are basically economic migrants. They spend a lot of time outside of their country and they're not with their extended families. And the reason that they destroy their identity documents is so that they can decide uh, based on need where they come from. 
So, you know, of course, if, if, you're, if you're from a non-war-torn country, then you, I guess, can say that you're from a war-torn country, let's say like Afghanistan or Syria or the Congo instead. Uh, so it gives you options, doesn't it? I mean, surely if you had a legitimate asylum claim, A, you'd come via safe routes, by the way, which do exist, despite what the left say. Uh, safe routes do exist, they're called airports. Uh, you can fly here and presumably claim asylum. But the fact that these people are anonymous is because they don't have a legitimate claim. Yeah, and they, they destroy their documents also as insurance because uh, it, it's much harder to actually deport these people if their asylum applications are rejected. Because uh, obviously, you know, the, the receiving countries are less cooperative if the, um, the rejected asylum seeker doesn't have their documents. Yeah. So, you know, perverse incentives there. So one of the Conservative leadership contenders, uh, of which there are a few now, so we've had uh, the likes of James Cleverley uh, declare that uh, he wants to run, uh, and, of course, Robert Jenrick, but also Tom Tugendhat. Now, Tom Tugendhat is a man that is known as a Conservative politician to be slightly more left-leaning than others, I would say. He voted Remain, for instance, so he's all for the EU and everything that goes with that, one would assume, including open borders and return policies that dictate that we should take our fair share, so-called, of migrants across Europe. Uh, he's declared today that if he were leader of the Conservative Party, if he were elected and then became Prime Minister, that he would be ready to leave the ECHR. Um, I'm not sure I believe him. Do you? No, I don't. I mean, there was an interesting uh, video clip released earlier on uh, on the sort of political website Guido Fawkes and um, Tom Tugendhat was given you know, a number of sort of rapid fire questions on, you know, COVID, foreign policy, uh, legal matters and so on. And he was asked point blank, would you leave the ECHR? And he said no straight away. And when was this? This was months ago, years ago? When was this, do we know? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure of the exact date. I've, I just saw the, the video now. But um, you've got to remember the Conservative Party have a tradition of, you know, sort of one nation wet Conservative politicians saying, if you like, you know, traditional or right-wing views in, in public, but actually doing the complete opposite in office. I mean, I, I you know, well, that's I believe exactly that. what they've done over the last two, three years, which I would suggest, Mike, is why they've just lost to the greatest defeat that the Conservative Party have ever encountered, because they've done exactly that. I mean, Rishi Sunak was famous for saying, I'm going to stop the boats, I'm going to do this, I'm going to lower taxes, and he didn't do any of those things. So, so you're suggesting, and I would agree with you, that Tom Tugendhat is taking a leaf out of the Rishi Sunak book um what could possibly go wrong yeah i mean um the uh the political commentator patrick o'flynn he's just published a really interesting article for the spectator and he uh, mentions the fact that um you know philip hammond when he was in office he actually said that he would consider leaving the european union if it couldn't be reformed but you know further on down the line when push came to shove and there was an actual sort of referendum. You know, Hammond was one of the most zealous supporters of the institution, despite the fact that it, it couldn't really be reformed. So, um, you know, the, what we're seeing here is another classic example of, you know, sort of tough talk and weak action. I mean, you've got to remember Tom Tugendhat is a, you know, a sort of global Britain type politician where, you know, he's, he's massively invested in foreign policy, defense, you know, being a big player on the international stage, uh, you know, that's the sort of raison d'etre. Yeah, he, uh, he seems to me to have a, the, the, a bit of a feeling of a John Major about him. Uh, and John Major was classically wet, wasn't he, uh, and one nation. So Tom Tugendhat strikes me as being very similar. Um, but even if we did leave the ECHR, the European Court, the jurisdiction of that court, I mean, do, do you think that would make any difference? And I guess the real question is, do we need to leave it in order to get control of our borders in Britain? Uh, I, I think leaving the European Court of Human Rights, the Strasbourg Court, won't actually make that much of a difference. Um, the, the, the problem is the European Convention of Human Rights is part of Brit British domestic law. By way of the European, uh, basically the, the European, uh, yeah, it's the, uh, the act that we enacted as a consequence of that directive from the EU, isn't it? The, uh, the, the Human Rights Act, effectively. Yeah, it's, it's the Human Rights Act, which was enacted in 1998. So the ECHR is part of domestic law. Hmm. The Strasbourg Court, you know, the, the European Court of Human Rights, 
doesn't actually interfere that often. So we in, could just sorry, we could just repeal that. Uh, the Human Rights Act, yeah, sure. Yeah. If you want to. Yeah. That would solve the problem, so we don't even need to leave the ECHR. Uh, right, Mike, look, we must go to a break now. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we've solved the immigration problem. Right there, there we go. Just uh, repeal the Human Rights Act. Don't worry about the ECHR. Um, but um, I think the takeaway from that is, though, Tom Tugendhat might just be saying things to the Conservative membership electorate just to get elected. Wow, who knew politicians say things that they don't mean?